Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I hope to spend the next few minutes really just giving you an idea of some of the programs and projects that we do at the Lancet and at the Lancet Oncology to really further dissemination of knowledge and understanding, as we've heard from Princess Dina here and from Eduardo, on the ground information from low to middle income countries. If you don't know what you've got, you don't know how to tackle the problem. Lancet is quite an unusual organization. I often liken us to being an NGO that happens to publish a few journals. And to give you an idea of the flavor of, of what motivates us, I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes and a little bit about the history of the journal. Because if you understand the history, you'll understand where we're coming from as, as a journal group. This uh, chap here is the founder of the Lancet, Thomas Wackley. He was a surgeon, born in London, but he was a real polymath of the era and he was a great Victorian reformer. A Victorian reformer, the, the reformers of this era, these were people in the UK particularly who were upset with the direction of travel. They were upset with progress, they were upset with healthcare, they were upset with many things that were happening in the UK back in the 1800s. Some of us could say the same thing today. Especially today. But he was a very motivational guy. And he was a member of parliament, he was a coroner, and he also formed the Lancet. And he founded the Lancet to root out corruption and quackery and to challenge the medical establishment. And I think it's important to note that the Lancet was and still is registered as a newspaper. We're not a journal, which means we were a journalistic endeavor which means we have a duty to hold institutions, people, science and medicine accountable for their actions. And the name The Lancet is a really lovely bit of wordplay by Thomas Wackley. A lancet can be an arch window in a church. It can also be a scalpel blade. And he said that he was going to name his new journal The Lancet because it can be an arch window to let in the light or it can be a sharp surgical instrument to cut out the dross and I intend to use it in both senses. And I think that gives you an idea of this advocacy, very motivated approach that the Lancet has taken and carries on to this day. So what really motivates us? We're a family of medical journals, sure, but we are committed to the best science for better lives. We stand for high quality and reliable medical science. We're vigilant, responsive, and fast. We're more than just a collection of journals. We're annoyed about the health systems and the health disparities in this world. We campaign for health equity and the right to health. We're unashamedly political. We hold those in power accountable for their promises. We're advocates and activists for health justice. <coughs> we believe that organized science can provide a strong platform for political and scientific advocacy. And on my own journal, The Lancet Oncology, our global advocacy program maps out the inequalities and inequities of health systems worldwide, highlighting deficiencies in all aspects of cancer care, health policy, structural organization, and leadership. The program offers a neutral platform to bring together thought leaders from across disciplines and organizations to offer solutions to those barriers that hinder success. And we aim to use the journal's international and influential voice to deliver the best science and better lives. Now, how do we do that? We have a number of programs and projects ongoing at any one time that really tackle the issue of global oncology. And these are some of the examples that we use. We have a program of commissions, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, series of papers. We develop bespoke treatment guidelines in various regions of the world. We run conferences, and we, have, we hold governmental and non-governmental events. Now, commissions go back a long way in the Lancet's history. And I've included here a couple of screen grabs, actually, of two papers, the first ever commissions pulled together by the Lancet in the 1800s. And a commission is essentially a white paper. It's where we as an organization can bring together partnerships between the key stakeholders in an issue. If there's an unmet need, who are those people that have the solutions and can tell us about those solutions? 
And here's a couple of examples of say from the 1800s. In 1860, the first ever commission by the Lancet looked at cholera in London. It was a major problem, and it advocated that the sewage system in London needed to be rebuilt. Thomas Wackley, being a member of parliament, that gave he had the levers to make that happen. The sewage system was rebuilt in London. Ten years later, a very seminal commission on overcrowding in the London workhouses. Again, Thomas Wackley was very vocal about the workhouses in the Houses of Parliament. You can look through the notes from that era and see some very powerful speeches by him on this. And he travelled up and down the country advocating for better health and better living conditions in the workhouses. But jumping right forward, you can see that those early commissions were political, but to this day we are still very political. In 2017, we published the start of a commission on healthcare in Syria and the weaponization of healthcare in that part of the world. Now, the Lancet Oncology's Commission's program has one overarching goal to highlight and provide solutions for inequities and health injustice. And there's really five guiding principles around that for us. We are interested in the, in the patient journey from prevention through to the end of life. We're interested in global cancer control and the regional variation. We're very interested in affordable cancer care or the lack of affordable cancer care. Inefficiencies in health systems and governance are often central to a lot of the problems we see. And we will advocate for change, accessing all and any levers for change. So for us, publication is the start of the journey. It's what you do with that knowledge is important. And all of our advocacy activities come together in this one hub, the Cancer Control Hub on thelancet.com. Everything we publish in this area, everything we're advocating is accessible through this hub. Lancet Oncology has published nine commissions to date. Our first commission back in 2011 looked at delivering affordable cancer care. But we have since then published uh, a number of these commissions. They often take two to three years to come together where we're looking at an unmet need and we have brought together the best experts around the world to look at this issue, to pull together the local data on the ground and to develop policies and actions and solutions. The titles there with stars by them are all in global oncology. And actually, we have four additional commissions ongoing at this time. So of our 13 commissions to date, eight are in the global oncology space, which shows our commitment to low to middle income country oncology control, cancer control. Series are another way in which we approach the problem of delivering better cancer control. And series are a collection of papers. Rather than a single narrative in a commission, a series may be as a collection of really important topics that are better presented as a series of standalone papers or standalone projects linked together in some way. Across the Lancet group, across our journals, we've published 156 global health series in recent years. From the Lancet Oncology, I've got a few slides here just showing some of those examples. Very recently, we published a series from Peru looking at on the ground, it's a number of papers, really interesting series, looking at cancer delivery, the mechanisms of that delivery in Peru, what the barriers to the, to, um, the delivery are, and offers a number of solutions. We've revisited this topic a few times across the journal. Cancer indigenous peoples, again, these are un really big unmet need. There's no data. But if someone doesn't start somewhere and report something, you'll never start the problem. As Princess Dina said, you have to start. You have to just get your feet in the water and start. And affordable cancer care, another important series for us that we keep revisiting through many, many channels. But we have a three additional global oncology series coming soon. Later this year, we'll be publishing a series on global cancer control in small island nations. And we're going to be launching this series. It's looking at the Pacific Islands and, and the Caribbean. And we're going to be launching this series at the Pacific Health Minister's meeting in, in uh, Tahiti and also at the Caribbean Health, me Health Minister's meeting. And those two groups have recently come together at the World Health Assembly to discuss collaboration. 
We have an ongoing piece of work looking at conflict and cancer. Again, a really big unmet need. And finally, we have the third instalment of our ongoing standing commission on cancer control in Latin America. But the Lancet, I'm very fortunate to work at a, an organization like the Lancet where we have brand recognition. We have a lot of uh, ability to convene people. And this shows just one example of that, the, the Guttmacher Lancet Commission on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. And at this particular launch event for this commission, we were able to bring together the former president of Chile, the French ambassador for global health, and Dr. Tedros, the director general of the WHO. It just shows some of the influence that the Lancet brand, in partnership, can afford. And across my own journal, Lancet Oncology, we also use our brand to bring people together to discuss these big unmet needs. And here's just a few photos from recent events, but it shows how we're bringing together thought leaders from Latin America, Nobel laureates, there's the former Vice President Joe Biden, perhaps the future President Joe Biden, <laughs> from the Moonshot program, our work in China and elsewhere. And also I put in a little news clipping there to show that we're also very active through the mainstream press to champion change or to challenge when we think something has gone wrong. And just earlier this week, we were delighted to see that the Lancet was recognized by the World Health Assembly as a global leader. Dr. Richard Horton, who's the editorial director of the Lancet Group, he was recognized as global health leader by Dr. Tedros on Monday this week. And addressing the 194 member states, Dr. Horton called on the delegates to join the struggle to protect and strengthen the values we share with health and universal health coverage as our ultimate objective. We need to talk less, listen more. Listening to people in poor and more precarious communities to their solutions as well as their concerns. Our progress should be measured and judged by health and resilience of the most vulnerable and marginalized. I think that's a really powerful statement. And how do we elicit this? We make use of all of our journals. We have 18 journals. All of these journals are supporting global health. They're all health activists and they often work both individually on their own topics of interest, but on the bigger topics, we'll work collectively to get a greater power and momentum. So I hope in just a few minutes there, I've just given you a very quick flavor of some of the projects and programs that the Lancet Group is involved in, but also how journals have a very privileged place where we can actually make a difference. And I think there's a moral obligation on editors-in-chief like myself to really participate, to stand up and pull, pull uh, people together to, to make these changes and to challenge our governments. So I think I'll stop there and thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, thank you, David. You are perfectly on time. So we have five minutes for a burning question, some comment. Please, you have microphones. If not, I have one. Uh, yes, here we have one. Please. Thank you uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, my question is about, uh, for global reach, I think we should also uh, consider uh, like a different language barrier that we're facing at this moment. So for your journal, do you have any plan to kind of uh, overcome this challenge? Yeah, it's a very good point. And actually, it's something we, we do um, tackle quite frequently, depending on the situation. So for example, with our standing commission on Latin America, we often produce the main report is in English, inevitably, but we do produce executive summaries in Portuguese and Spanish. For our work in China, we also have often Mandarin versions. But we've also done French versions for certain activities. Some of our Francophone African work, we've done French versions for that. So it's certainly part of our makeup to do that, yes. Thank you so much for the very nice presentation. I was looking very hard 
to find Africa somewhere. Mm. Does it mean Africa does not have cancer or we are not writing? Yeah, so we, we do. We have published actually a couple of series, series on cancer control in Africa. Some of the barriers for, in, in Africa, of course, is the lack of on-the-ground data uh, and reliable data. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we shouldn't tackle it. We must tackle this. And, and again, those series highlighted some of the solutions for that. And we've been working with various partners to help promote some of those activities. For example, the Cancer Registry um, in Africa. AFROX, Professor David Kerr, I don't know if he's in the room, but uh, the work he's doing, we've, we've been working with him on some of those aspects too. So you're absolutely right, major issue, and, and we're, we're with you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I, my name is Brylene. I serve as the Pan-African Parliament Food Security Ambassador for the continent. And um, one of the things that I've also been saying is about communication, that um, that is the biggest challenge that we've got on the continent. But um, as Dr. Wu rightfully said about collaborations, perhaps it's also an opportunity for us coming from the continent maybe to take on board some of our youngsters from Africa as well that can um, perhaps assist in the in extrapolating the information that you need. I mean, I work very closely with the government and of course with the masses on the ground. I've just recently come back from, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the cyclones and um, the three hit countries, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. I went as far as Baira and also Chichimani Mani in Zimbabwe, and the situation is very bad. Accessing the place is also almost impossible now, especially after the devastating um, cyclone. So it's, it's challenges like that to say, right, as much as you would like to assist, but how do we possibly partner or collaborate and see when we go out, as I go out as a food security ambassador and then take along with some of you, then you can extrapolate the information you need from the ground as well. Um, that will really be appreciated. Um, we, um, we really emulate the wonderful work you're doing and um, also the fact that we are now reaching out to the countries and of course we understand your constraints, but we are here yeah. and I think uh, we should start engaging. Absolutely, I think you raised a really important point about the, some of the big structural issues that we have. In fact, Dr. Horton in, in his uh, address on Monday said we need to declare a planetary emergency planetary health emergency and we launched actually a journal last year called the Lancet Planetary Health and it's to tackle exactly these sorts of issues that are real structural basic concerns that hinder anything if we're going into advanced medicine you, you've got some very structural issues there so I'm, I completely agree we need but we also need information on the ground we need to let the world know what's happening and one strand which I didn't talk about today is our journalistic activities and we have a network of journalists, we have a news desk, we have these sec a section called a reportage which is an on the ground report of what's going on. You know if you let people know what's happening then we can find solutions. So very happy to work with you. We have time for only one burning question. So just to add to her question, are you actively recruiting from the continent journalists or medical journalists that can help you sort of bridge that gap? We, we certainly publish a lot of material from, from Africa. We, we've published a number of papers in that region, and we do have reporters in the region, yes. Yeah. The very last one. <laughs> Over there, please. <laughs> Uh, my name is Twali Ngoma from Tanzania. As the editor-in-chief, how do you make decisions about commissioning papers or getting series? What, what criteria do you use? I mean, to decide this goes to Chile or goes to Tanzania or goes to that, or do we have to ask for that? Well, there, there, there are multiple ways, really, multiple channels. One, one channel, of course, is our program is to look at the global picture. So we are interested in Latin America, we're interested in Europe, we're interested in North America, we're interested in Africa. We, we, you know, we, we're trying to map out the world, the inequalities. So we are covering Africa as part of that program. But of course we really welcome people coming to us, sharing with us their experiences and highlighting some of the big deficiencies so that we know what, what the problems are and see where we can partner and help to 
shine a light on those issues. So it's a two-way street. We have programs, but we're very open to listening to ideas and having people partner with us. Well, thank you very much, David. Yeah. Thanks. As you see, it seems that dissemination of the information is uh, something that is uh, needed and also is part of the approach to improve cancer control issues. Thank you.